is programmed to bring you a special bulletin. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Five, check for sound. Four, it's showtime. Three, let's two, go. One. You're listening to the Pro Audio Suite, a program for audio and voiceover professionals. Welcome to another Pro Audio Suite. We have in Boulder, not in Boulder, Colorado, but in Colorado, we have George Whittam. Hello there, yes, and I am in Boulder, Colorado this week. Ah, uh-huh. no, 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 no. In <laughs> Chicago, we have Robert Marshall. Hello from Chicago. It's always windy in Chicago, especially when Robert's there. And yeah, now it's hot. And uh, of course, <laughs> up in, you know, you know what I mean, Robert. And uh, in Sydney, of course, we have Robbo. Oh, hello. And we have a special guest joining us for the whole episode. We do have a special guest joining us for the whole episode, and he's a mate of yours and mine, Mr. Phil Lentz. How are you? I'm very well, thank you, and uh, uh, great to be in such fabulous company. That's good. I'm <laughs> glad. Well, that's, that's a good start to the show. We might end it there because that <laughs> might be as good as it gets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not going to get any better. Uh, for those who don't, who don't know Phil, Phil, oh, geez, Phil actually gave me my first job in radio. Uh, way back in the day. And Phil's background is obviously radio, a radio jock, a radio program director, and also a very talented audio engineer and voiceover guy. So, uh, Mr. Multi-Talented, we should call you, Phil. Yes, well, they usually call me just a freelancer, but uh, I I prefer to uh, think of it as unemployed. (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I, I promised the last episode, I promised the guys a very embarrassing story about my early days Uh-oh. as an audio engineer and how I came to meet you. I, uh, I had always wanted to work in radio, and I don't know if you'll remember this, you may not, but it certainly stuck in my memory. I had been, my only experience as an audio engineer was three days work experience in the production studios at Today FM. And there was a guy up there who was the audio engineer at the time, a guy called Richard Monk. And he was going out to lunch and very kindly left the eight track set up with a commercial that he'd just recorded (laughs) and said, here you go, have a play around with this uh, while I go to lunch. So I sort of, you know, pulled up a bit what I thought was a great sounding mix and ran it off to a cassette and thought, awesome, there's my demo. <laughs> and <laughs> Phil, by by some mere coincidence, a couple of weeks later, I, after firing off letters, Phil called me in and said, look, come down to 2SM, come and say hello and introduce yourself and uh, let me hear your demo tape. So I proudly marched in with my demo tape. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember this, Phil? Uh, I, I do. Um, th- there was a little bit more of a backstory there too, Darren, because um, you weren't actually, now I, I, I hate to tell you this, but you weren't the first choice for the job. <laughs> right, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> However, you were the right choice for the job, and I'll tell you why. Because the guy who um, I actually hired to do the job before, I, I, uh, I think I actually probably saw you and, uh, and, and spoke to you uh, by that stage. But um, someone else had applied for the job, and um, he, he'd actually worked um, uh, part-time at, at a recording studio. Right. And I thought, well, he's got more experience, so he's he's really the better choice for the job. But but to about one week into the job, he resigned because he got the job that he wanted, which was at the recording studio. Right, okay. Well, the, so the re- there, therefore, you were the first on the list. Nice. So the rest <laughs> of the embarrassing story, now I know that, that's embarrassing enough. The yes. rest of the embarrassing story was, and I should go back to the me doing the demo, I thought I had this amazing delay sound. Like I thought, wow, right. that sounds so cool. That's such a, you know, a delay. I had it, or oh, sounds awesome. Phil very generously during the interview said, um, yeah, I think it sounds really good, um, but you've left two channels open and one is the today version as the other is the tomorrow version. (laughs) 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 Uh, I'm sure sure it wasn't the last time that happened. (laughs) 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 So there you go. That was my first yeah. experience with a very generous Phil Douse. A uh, Phil Douse, Phil Lentz. <laughs> I was going well, to say, Phil Douse generous. That, that, really. that's yeah, Phil Douse isn't generous. Trust Dows. me. Hello, Phil, if you're listening, by the way. <laughs> <I was gonna laughs> <say>. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Actually, talk about and getting your first, first break in, in work as an audio engineer, Robert Marshall. Um, I've never asked you how you got your first Oh, run. boy. And what was it? So um, I got out of college 
with a degree in music composition. And I, my first gig was basically just for a summer or so, about maybe six months, um, selling software actually at the uh, music shop locally. Um, uh, and then around that time, I was also able to then get a job as an audio video assistant at a post-production place that mainly did corporate videos. And the funny thing is, I'd always been running my own studio since I was sort of in high school. Um, I interned at a few studios in late high school and worked at that same studio um, through college. So then when I discovered the Avid video editorial system, it was like, oh my God, screw audio, this is so cool. And I wanted to do that. At that point, I'd also met a friend who worked at a bigger uh, post-production facility in Chicago, um, and he kind of sat me down one day and basically said, you're an audio person, and unless you want to go back to school for a long time, you're really going to have a long run at trying to really get become a video person. And so I kind of refocused on that, and I had um, been then therefore looking for some other jobs, and I began freelancing at a smaller studio, um, mainly that was doing like voiceover classes and I was manning the board for voiceover classes. And then they would call me in for other freelance things. Um, eventually they said, uh, one of their guys was leaving. So they, uh, they hired me and I left this one video shop, went to that shop. I was there for maybe a year and then cutters, which was the one of the three really big post houses in Chicago, right around that same time, they had um, switched from audio file to Pro Tools. And they had had some not so smooth running sessions in this transition because it's a lot to switch over to the from one system to the other if you've been running one of them for years and years and years. So they interviewed me mainly as a Pro Tools expert, because at that point I'd learned Pro Tools in college, was selling it and then running it at my home studio, running it at this other studio. Um, if you keep in mind, at that time, Pro Tools was the more affordable option to something like an audio file or a Fairlight. So they hired me as an audio assistant, kind of dropped back down from engineer to audio assistant. But at that point, Cutters was really where I began doing you know national TV spots and and then I was there for 15 years, which is the same place where uh, we eventually spawned Source Elements out of. Wow. There you go. And the story was in real time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how did you get your break, Phil? Um, I started, uh, now I'm probably the oldest of this group, but I started in 1969 when I was 15 years of age. Uh, <laughs> so no university education here, folks. Um, I uh, Basically, I, I went on a tour of the local station. I come from a little town um, called Rockhampton in Queensland, um, which uh, a lot of people have been through, but not many people have stopped at. <laughs> um, what I um, what I did was I, I asked for a tour of the uh, of the uh, the station. Uh, I asked my uh, I guess my hero announcer of the time, which was a guy called Andrew Haskett, who uh, currently works in uh, Fort Worth at um, uh, the Christian University there as a lecturer. And I. Um, a couple of months after that, I think I I actually uh, just said. I'd really like a job. And they said, oh, okay. Uh, and unfortunately, they had um, had a, a position that they could put me in. So I started as an announcer. In those days, announcers uh, were also producing commercials, uh, which doesn't really happen a great deal today. And um, it, it really just started from there back in analogue, full track, mono days. I do remember doing commercials when my first radio gig would have a, a library of KPM discs. <laughs> and uh, you would have your script, you would queue up the piece of music, hit record, yep, and then yeah. you'd be writing the faders live. Or actually, it wasn't a fader in those days, it was a knob, but... Um yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's certainly the way the way that we worked. And um, we had at my first station, which was Four Ro. I was there for for quite a while, for seven years, which is a long time in radio. Um, and we had two two studios. Uh, one was on air all the time, and the other studio was was pretty badly equipped. It had been built in the nineteen forties, I think, and it was was really not good. Uh, and what I um, what we did was we we take a, a KPM disc or um, or even God for bid an instrumental album, commercially released <laughs> album, which we did in the country, uh, in regional areas, and um, we take that in and uh, and and play that underneath the uh, underneath the voiceover. Then we'd come out to the control room where we were recording and and do a drop edit um, 
of a sting from the, the same track. And that was the production. Wow. Well, your accuracy came a long way after that because uh, I think I mentioned <laughs> I the other want week. To. <laughs> well, I, 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 we were talking about this the other week on the show. You, when you introduced me to karting, uh, I was shown not that we just cue the start of the, the quarter inch tape up and line the cart up and, and hit go on both. You had actually gone to the trouble of measuring the exact distance back that the quarter inch tape need to be cued. Yep. I for it this. to slip start <laughs> onto the cart. So, so, and then, and I don't, can, correct me if I'm wrong, but was it you that had that button? You would push one button that started both. Started both, yeah, yeah. Was that you? Abs- absolutely, yes. So that was well, that was my idea. The text, the text managed to uh, managed to wire it up, uh, which yeah. which was great. But 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 I figured that. Um, um, you don't get any consistently unless you have standards. So the standard I had was, I, I as you say, I, I actually measured the uh, measured the distance of roll time that we needed to get get to if it was a vinyl record to get to the start of the record, yeah. and, and also I think we actually marked on the um, on the playhead uh, of a reel to reel as well yes. where the yeah. um, where the the audio started and we That's wanted right. it back a, cer- a certain distance. So, so in, you had in little both arrows. Cases, yeah, you had little arrows on the quarter inch machine yeah. for for both speeds, and so you would you would find the start of the audio, mark it with a China graph, and then cue it back to these predetermined places that Phil had marked on the quarter inch machine, and also on the turntable. Well, if I'm not well, it was consistency, correct. wasn't it? And it did, yeah, did seem absolutely. to work. This this <laughs> reminds me of me in high school. <laughs> well, it's something that it's something that stuck with me because I could, having done it for so long, by the time I moved on to other radio stations, I I could visualise where Phil's marks. Work. Yep. And it was something that I did for the rest of my career. Whenever I was carding something, was I would mark it with a china graph, slide it back to about where Phil's spot was. Although there was no <laughs> button that started both, I would make sure that yeah. fingers went on to both at the same time. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so yeah, there you go. And, and guys, don't we just miss carding? Oh, don't we just? I was going to yeah. say, my, my first setup when I was in high school, I had a TAC 3340 tape deck and I had a yep. Insonic sequencer that had all my drums and everything else on it. And I didn't have any FSK or SMPTE or anything like that, nor could I really spare a track on my four track anyways. So I measured the distance between the playhead and the um, record head. And I would always have to do a tape from so 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 the, I, I would use the playhead or the record head depending if I was overdubbing or just playing back, and I'd always line the song up from the same point. So I would have a um, a mark on the deck of the four track that I'd line up with a mark I put on the tape with a china marker again, and then I got really yep. good at pushing the play on the sequencer and the four track at exactly the same time. There you and go. there you go. So he would have been perfect in karting, Phil. It's <laughs> <laughs> a yeah. missed opportunity. <laughs> I tell you yeah. what, though, it, it, as much as we jest, I have to say that it, it, it's one of another one of those radio things that's taken a job out of the process that sort of welcomed you into the industry though you know what I mean it was that yeah. karting was that place where you went when you like me you knew nothing you thought that that, that two different takes with both faders up was actually delay <laughs> <laughs> that, that was also how they found flanging too <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> yes but you know yeah. what I mean it was that stepping stone into the industry I mean from there how, how I progressed th- through to my career was I, I, when the guy's I think his name was Paul in production, commercial production, finished at night. I'd jump in there and I'd get his quarter inch tape that he'd recorded all his voice tracks on. And I had my own um, eight track tape and I would load that up. And for an hour or two before I went home, I would remake his commercials. So by the time he left, I was ready to move up. So, um, but it's taken, not not having carding these days has taken that step out of the process. And and sometimes I wonder whether that's for better or worse. Yeah, it's it's true in television as well that um, that unfortunately everyone needs to be an expert these days because all the uh, I guess all the fat has been cut out of the staff. Not not that I'm suggesting that anyone was fat, but um, it, 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 it's just me. You just have to come into it, uh, you know, hit the ground running and be be trained, ready to go. If mm. if you think about it, no, like no one even needs to make dubs anymore. That was a whole job as an intern, and it's like there's no, it's like need a copy of that. It's like drag and drop. There you go. There's a copy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was also the same as working in like we had country radio in, in the UK. It's like hospital radio, and I assume it's regional radio in in the states as well. I mean that that kind of that that whole apprenticeship in uh, in yeah. the business is kind of gone. 
And that, that was basically when you were rubbish. And uh, by, after a couple of years, you were actually almost at the point where you could get a job in, in a capital city. Mm. Pretty much. Either, yeah, either so that I or you'd go running away because you were so abused that <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, yeah, so burnt out. Well, well, the other story that Phil should tell us about, because it wasn't just carts that Phil used to record and queue up, was it? We used to uh, used to do some stuff live on air, right, Phil? Um, what was that, Darren? <laughs> did you? Yes, to, you did. Used to I saw your, you doing used to record that, your ad, Used to record your talk breaks and time them out perfectly and, and queue them up and fire them uh, off I from think, memory. Yeah, I, I have done. I, th- I think um, I think most of them were actually done live. Or what? What? You know, it's a pretty simple system. But I'm see, I'm a systems person, so I like systems. But what I used to do was if I if I had a um, and normally if you're talking over the intro of, of a song, then uh, as an announcer, you you um, make write write out what you're going to say um, nah. and then I just put a little arrow I work out where the timing point was to start the start the record and put an arrow where to start the record and and I actually still use it today for uh, for di- for different things and uh, particularly if, if you're doing something live um, it just means that that um, you've got a much better chance of it actually hitting the mark properly so most of the things I, I did were were live like that but if there was an interview or something along those lines which was or, or something which was pre-recorded um, mm. Then I, and and we we're playing a, a relevant song afterwards. I'd certainly go go back, listen to the listen to the uh, the last ten seconds of the interview, um, and know that say the intro of the song was eight seconds, and and work out roughly where it should be. Then just write out write out the um, the cue where I I start the uh, start the music from. You know, so I mean it, it's just a little system, but it, um, it for me it works well. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I vaguely remember Phil you, you recording talk breaks in Perth. Um, maybe I did. I don't, I don't know. Of course, um, these days, um, at certain stations where I may or may not freelance, um, <laughs> the announcers do all their talk breaks recorded. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, no, I, yes. I mean, they're yeah, actually no. sitting in the, they're sitting in the studio, um, but they record it, um, before, 10 minutes before. Yeah, 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 and a lot of them are recording for because var- they're networked, so they're recording different talk breaks for different well, cities. Well, indeed, and, and the technology, of course, these days um, allows them to do that with, uh, with with quite a bit of freedom. Unfortunately, the downside of that is that um, you know you get somebody in uh, on air in Melbourne who's <laughs> maybe never been to Melbourne. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yes, we know that one. Well, we've got a new breakfast <laughs> show starting in Melbourne, hosted by a guy who's just finished his breakfast show in London. <laughs> so, never lived in Australia before. Yeah, so that's, that's true. Yeah, interesting, interesting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that'll be fun. Yeah, he, he has a switch from Vegemite to Marmite, or Marmite to Vegemite. <laughs> Marmite to Vegemite. Okay, of course. just making sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Same sort of taste, but just slightly different. But uh, yeah, that is, uh, I've, I've sort of scratched my head about that one, but I, I'm kind of guessing it's Duncan Campbell, who we also know from Perth. Um, we do indeed. He, and uh, I, I also know from uh, Sydney, actually. He, he worked with me in Sydney. Yeah, well, he was with us at 2SM. He was a music he director. Was. Uh, he was the music director and um, uh, later on became the program director, yeah. It will be interesting, but I'm sort of like <laughs> hedging my bets and thinking, well, if he's English... Maybe they need some imaging for someone that kind of sounds a bit English and a bit Australian. I, could, I reckon I could fit in there. A bit, a bit posh. Oh, Andrew, yeah, that's posh. Speaking of imaging, Phil, are you still doing voiceover work? I, I certainly am still doing it, but um, <laughs> not as much as I used to. Uh, and that's nothing to do with me. It's just that a lot of it is, uh, you know, as I'm sure you uh, all attest, has, uh, has sort of dried up and gone away. And I think, I think if you're in Sydney and Melbourne, you probably have a much better chance, particularly with, um, with Foxtel in Sydney. Um, because of their multitudinous channels, but um, if you if you're anywhere else, um, I, I think you've really got to sell yourself very well, and that's something I've never really been very good at. Oh yeah, it's all about, um, and I think everyone on the panel would contest to that. It's a uh, you know now it's all about marketing. You don't have to be the best; you just have to say you are. Yes, there is a lot. Yeah, there's um, there's a guy I, I occasionally work with at, Ch- at Channel Seven here who is uh, he's not the main voiceover person, and that's uh, a guy called Fred Bonnicke. But uh, this other guy. Um, um, does it when Fred's not available, when, he, when he's on holidays or whatever. And um, he used to be um, one of two main voiceover people in Perth. This goes back 20 years. Uh, now he's a greenkeeper at a, at a bowls club and occasionally gets a, a call to do a voice job and like once, once every two or three weeks. 
Are you trying to depress me, Phil? <laughs> I was going to say, hey, hey, there's your future. I want to know your secret, Andy, because, you know, you, you seem to be on everything. You seem, to be, <laughs> you seem to be getting a lot of work. What's your secret? I don't know whether it's a secret, but I, I think um, I saw a lot of people sitting around, and, I, and it goes back to the whole radio thing, but I saw a lot of, you know, your ducky darling actors sitting around in Ackland Street in St Kilda uh, complaining about their agents not giving them a call. When I first moved to Melbourne from Sydney, I got all my uh, demos done, headshots, everything, and I just walked through Melbourne just going to every single ad agency, every single studio, and then, you know, waited for the calls. And once you get one call, then you go to a studio, they like what you do, hopefully you get a call back and get another one. And then I think also having having a, a different accent helps with me because f- working in like Southeast Asia and the Middle East. Yeah, it's 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 not certainly not what you call an Australian accent, but it but it um it doesn't sound out of place in Australia, and yep. uh, I think I think it, it sounds uh it, it sounds a little posh, but that's yep. a good thing, and and that sets you apart from a from a number of other people. Well, the weirdest thing is, is someone said to me, um, "What was it? You're the busiest female voice actor in <laughs> in Melbourne," <laughs> and uh, and it was like I kind of I kind of get what you mean there because a lot of the products I was doing was yeah. targeting females. So yeah, in in recent years, I, I've I've done a, an enormous amount of training videos for the mining industry in Central Queensland through contacts that I made when I was living there many years ago, and uh, unfortunately, once the mining tax uh, came out, as um, uh, you uh, guys in the United States. States wouldn't be aware of it, but um, the government introduced a tax on on mining companies. Uh, the mining industry uh, pretty much died, and um, so therefore the voiceover work for the mining industry also died. Well, that's funny you should say that because one of my clients is BHP. <laughs> Um, um, that was yes. used to be one of Phil's. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you're not working so yes. much. <laughs> no, it was actually an English guy that was doing their their work. And um, he wasn't a trained voice guy, did the voiceover thing. It took forever. And um, and I just happened to be knocking on a door when yeah. they had to do another version of that video and went, great, bang, you, you've got the gig. Well, and a lot of the training videos um, are enormously long. Some of them run 30 minutes and, and longer. So um, I can understand that it it, it it takes a really good voiceover person a long time to do them. Yeah, yeah. Well, e-learning is a killer. Oh, um, I know. That, I've done a lot of that as well. Yeah, where, yeah. Um, and, and have you had to cut up all the uh, all the little bits as well? And, yep, um, and you save each them individual separate file. Files. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, if it's it's like I think it's like any script. If they if they uh, write it correctly and uh, number the paragraphs and uh, do all that sort of stuff, you got a chance. If if not, you got no chance. Yeah, but you guys should charge extra files. for that. Like all the editing and stuff should be. <laughs> it's like. You know, it's like there's some audio guy that's going like, I could have done that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do charge for it. Good. I, I even go further. But, uh, I, right. I think you guys should charge for your home studios as well. I agree. Well, in, in the television industry, it's quite, it's quite because um, I do um, a lot of freelance audio, a lot of uh, location recording. Well, when I say a lot, I wish it was a lot. <laughs> I do some location recording. Um, so I have my own equipment as, as what you really have to have. Um, and, and it's fairly commonplace. I mean, I don't normally charge for my equipment. Equipment. Maybe I should, but um, but most people do. Most of the freelance um, audio people do. Well, yeah, the, the the guys like like here it's the same way. The guys like you know going on set with the boom and the recorders, they'll charge for their themselves. Actually, I don't even know. Sometimes they're probably hired, expecting to bring your own gear. But what I'm saying is that you know, as the home voiceover artist has basically decimated a lot of the sort of smaller studios, especially in regional areas, the 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 clients have basically just grown used to not having that cost anymore. And even sometimes specifically saying, we're casting this, and if you don't have your own studio, don't audition. And so they're now getting that yeah, far-end right. studio for zero the cost because the talent's forced to basically throw it in, but still shoulder all the cost of equipping it and learning how to use it and basically becoming an audio engineer that they weren't before. And I think it depends on, um, it, it depends obviously on the client because uh, smaller clients may uh, not be prepared to uh, to pay extra, but but uh, cl- clients like uh, like the, the, the Capital City radio stations in Australia, it, it's not really relevant it's relevant to them, you know. They'll, they'll just pay whatever they have to pay to get the job done. They, they don't really care that much. Yeah, there there used to be some clients that would actually say, "Whatever, you've got a home studio. Here's where you're going." 
but it's becoming a lot more common and it's sort of a revenue stream or it depends on what side you're of the fence you're on, but it's a cost that's no longer there for the clients a lot of the time because um, it's just expected that if you're a voice talent, you have to be set up at your house and therefore you have to basically have exactly. a studio. And you're not paying a studio fee. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I used to, uh, being what I do, uh, Phil, I, I mean, I set up voice acting studios all over the U.S. And I was really concerned that, uh, you know, studio owners out there were had me on a dartboard <laughs> in the back. Um, yeah. <laughs> my picture, because I was really concerned that I was, you know, facilitating this loss of business for all of these commercial yeah. studios, um, you know, in, in a way. But... Uh, I was I was enabling the actors to do what they had to do to meet their clients' demands at the, at the time, you know. But it was a it was a weird feeling. Uh, and if they don't do it, they they're not competitive these days. Yeah, there's yeah. still one one studio in Sydney that I know of who one guy said it's anybody who has a setup at home will never work in my studio. The the thing is, you can't um, fight so, these things by taking that attitude because you'll just end up more outside the fence. When his agency client walks in the door and says, "We've booked Andrew Peters for a voiceover for our." L'Oreal commercial <laughs> yeah. today. Is he going to turn around to them really and go, well, fuck off, I'm not doing it? This is this is the thing that even Source Elements was a little bit like accused of early on. We I would try to sell Source Connect to some studios and they would say, well, we want to use ISDN. And then you talk to them a little bit more. And it's like, basically, we want to use ISDN because we can charge more for it. And that's a big revenue stream. And, and we feel like if we are using Source Connect, somehow we're supposed to provide downstream all these cost savings that we're going to get from using Source Connect instead of ISDN. And and I was like, no one said anything about lowering rates. It's still a remote <laughs> connection. Right. You still have to right. do set it up and buy the you software. Gotta, it's like charge the yeah. same. Um, but that was a concern that they were... And then the other thing that I do hear about sometimes, I, I heard about it more then than now, and I think that George has solved this problem a lot and just overall information and the abundance of more affordable equipment. But a lot of the times audio engineers would say, oh, God, we're recording some guy from his house. What am I going to get? And they, they were like, you know, scared or, you know, they didn't, they, they, they would prefer just to send the guy to a studio and know that they've got, you know, the, the sure thing. But the pushback from that is pretty much gone these days. I mean, that's something from 10 years ago even or longer. I uh, I do commercial production for Nova on a part-time basis in Perth and um, they're pretty much all voices are on uh, um, most capital city stations these days in my experience are done remotely and uh, it's 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 fairly, actually fairly rare that anyone actually um, stands uh, opposite you in the, in the uh, studio and actually does a voiceover. Um, it does happen from time to time, but and, and mostly um, because um, RMK, the main talent agency for voiceovers in Sydney, has uh, installed, I believe, two studios. Um, they uh, they pick up traffic noise uh, and they're not great, but they're uh, they're quite acceptable. But I, I find that. Um, in uh, an engineer or a, a production person in radio terms um, using voiceovers which have come from um, RMK, uh, from other studios and also for, uh, quite a few from home studios that um, essentially they're pretty good but thank heavens for Isotope RS6, yes. RS6 <laughs> for being able to get rid of all the background noise. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting because RMK, unlike, and I should get the other agents a fair plug too, because EM Voices and uh, and now uh, yeah, Scout, and, and which was EM Voices Evans. are used by uh, people I work for as well. Yeah, yeah, and Kathy Evans, which is now Scout, they and do. Uh, Ka- but, Kathy as well. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I know that RMK is the only one who has um, a set up <clears throat> uh, a voice booth, which they they've had for years from memory. Yeah, for a long time. For and in fact, 12, I've got a funny feeling that Kathy Evans used to be one of the engineers in the really early days at RMK. Really. Wow. Yeah, I think so. Hearing you talk about that, do you remember the days when the production guy used to walk into the on-air studio and go, hey, when you're finished, I've got a few scripts for you to read? (laughs) Yes. And the reason that he would walk into the studio, he or she would walk into the studio and tell them that, is that otherwise they'd go off and go to lunch and you'd never see them again. Exactly, that's right. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll come and see you after lunch. Um, No, look, one of them's on air, (laughs) just in a half an hour. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And now... I'll tell you what, you, you learn your chops pretty quickly doing that because you walk in after... 
a, you know, your three or four hour shift and then you'd be handed, you know, 10, 15, 20 scripts. <laughs> 25, 30. <laughs> yeah, you just pick up this like small tome and uh, that you chug yeah, through. Well, yeah, well, particularly by the time uh, one or two o'clock in the afternoon comes around, I mean, there's probably not going to be any other um, uh, mm-hmm. DJs around yeah, to voice that's anything, right. so you get yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, grab them now or never. That's right. I, used to, exactly. I, still remember, I still remember the comment I used to get on many occasions saying, yeah, that was good. Now can you read the words that are on the page? <laughs> 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 but that's because you were going off, for right? the copywriter job, right? You were bored with voiceover. <laughs> yeah, <that's> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Phil, yeah. here's one you might remember, talking about processes and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I think we touched on this a couple of weeks ago. Matt Ponsonby, the, yeah. f- the first and only blind DJ I ever worked with. He, yep. was, uh, he was quite a character. He certainly was. Um, I did do some um, some commercials with him, um, and I also, um, as program director of uh, 2SM at the time, it was I think during the light and easy period. He uh, did some on air shifts. Um, the, the way the way just for the for the um, uh, anyone listening who hasn't. Uh, worked with uh, a person who has a sight impairment before, uh, typically what they'll do is they'll have a, a Braille writer of some kind, like a little type typewriter. Does anybody rem- remember typewriters? Mm, mm. Um, and um, and we'll, we'll say, okay, read the script to me and, and punch it away on the, on the Braille typewriter and then go in the studio and read it. And, um, I mean, it's, it's quite effective. It takes probably, you know, an extra minute and is no is no hassle. It, as far as the on air shifts were concerned, we had uh, Matt doing midnight to dawn, which was the only shift that we had available, and, and he really needed the work at the time. Um, but he um, he would, uh, I think we we actually brailed. Uh, the the cart numbers of the commercials. That was my put, job. Put a, a braille demo on there. Yeah, that was my job. Yeah. We had to, oh, every okay. Friday afternoon, he'd come in and he'd bring his little braille machine. Yep. That typed like a demo label, like those yep. old yep. No, demo labels, and all the new CDs. I'd have to read him the number, and he would braille it, and we'd stick this. So when he walked into the CD library, he could feel his way around and find yeah. the CDs, and and the same on the carts in the studio and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and um, I don't know if you remember this, Darren, but we also had uh, Grant Goldman's son. Mike Mike Goldman, who is is now uh, you know well and truly entrenched in the radio industry, he wasn't in the industry at the time. He was, I think, fresh out of high school. And uh, Grant said, "Can you can you get Mike to come in and um, and he'll help out for free?" And yeah. um, and and that's what happened. And, and basically, Mike sat opposite uh, Matt was at uh, behind the behind the board, as our American friends would say, behind the console, as we would say. And he he pushed the buttons, but uh, Mike Goldman was there to assist. In in, in in case he was uh, needed at the time. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember working weekends, going in on weekends to make uh, to make commercials or doing whatever I was doing and Matt would be on air and you'd get this phone call in the production studio, hey, Robbo, can you come up to the on-air studio? And you'd get up there and be like, what's it like? What's it look like outside? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's one of the problems, I guess, that uh, you have if you have a sight impairment, yeah. There, uh, there are yeah, a lot yeah. of things I, these days with well, screen I, readers I, uh, that, that uh, help out. Well, you can say, oh, yeah, Josh. I... I uh, I was uh, like, I got to work with a voice actor consulting in her home studio more than one time, but this is the one time I worked with somebody face to face who is uh, visually impaired. And um, she was using SoundForge. And I asked why, because, you know, there's so many kinds of software. I always want to know why. And she said it was the one that another sight impaired or visually impaired actor recommended to her because nearly every single function in editing could be mapped or was already mapped on the keyboard. So it required no use of the mouse for her to edit. And I watched her work and it was pretty impressive watching her how quickly she, in essence, scrubbed back and forth, you know, finding in and out points and everything, found all her edit points and cleaned up that recording. It was Quite impressive, but yeah, apparently yeah. SoundForge is, well, is a boon to the. I, I found you know, I found someone at the Avid conference, uh, the developers conference, and there's a whole another system. I'm trying to remember because it's something like Pro Tools, but um, I mean the computer speaks back to you a little bit, and he can run. I mean he's blind, completely blind, and he can run Pro Tools completely, and wow. and he was advocating for Avid to add some more features to here and there so that it would work with these various um, systems that provide feedback uh, so that you know you know where your mouse is. Um, and actually, an, 
another really interesting thing. Um, like one of our one of our contacts over at Avid, he's been there forever, and um, unfortunately, I, I think he he had um, you know diabetes or something. But he had this thing where his his retina separated, and he he went blind over time. And um, but yeah, he's uh, so he was aware of that and they were working with these other guys to make pro tools oper- operable for you know completely visually impaired people it's really cool interesting well you've seen a lot of changes phil in um since 1969 in fact i saw for sale recently a uh, roller 77 um, mark three work- in working yeah mark three in working order 650 <laughs> bucks um, i was very tempted because uh, just so i can scare myself one more time by sitting there going yeah. oh that tape's gonna be on it Oh no, the machine's not on. Switch and then watch going. <laughs> Wait no! for a couple of minutes. <laughs> Fifteen minutes later, waiting for the light to well, come they, on. Well, they were great machines. These uh, these uh, rollers. They were an Australian-made uh, machine uh, uh, for for our American friends. But um, they had the most um, speedy path of threading the tape that you could <laughs> you could ever find. And and if you're really uh, adept at it, you could just go. <laughs> And the tape would yep. be threaded, Where, as opposed to other other machines, which, uh, which which you just couldn't do that on. The the one that I preferred though for drop editing, uh, and if anyone uh, is listening who doesn't know what drop editing is, it's where you go from play and <laughs> it's it's like quick punch in Pro quick Tools. Punch. So you're yeah, going quick you're punch. going from play to record instantly. So punching um, and in, yeah. uh, but what you. Yeah, exactly, punching in. But what you have to do with an analog machine is because you have the record head and the play head and the erase head at different different physical locations there, a few centimetres from each other, you have to predict when the, the beat of the song or when the edit point is going to be. So you have to actually hit the record button a fraction of a second early. early. Yeah. The, um, or the just run at a faster tape speed. Six, just run well, it. the faster the better. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. just run it 30 there, there was another one before the before the roller Mark III, uh, roller seventy seven Mark III, which was called the 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 Bayer sixty six Mark II is the one I used, um, which had the heads much closer together and, and did beautiful drop edits. It was just amazing. You couldn't pick it from a splice, but see, we didn't have we didn't have um, splicing in those days because the manager thought that uh, it was too expensive to replace the tape. <laughs> but but to do those yes. drop ins, why wouldn't you just use the sync head? You know how like all modern Multi tracks would uh, could play back off of the record head, so you wouldn't have well, that, that would time require difference. the machine having a sync head. Uh, <laughs> so, and and for for those of you who don't know too, um, by, by the sync head, w- what happens is the um, it sounds like okay, crap. How does this work again? <laughs> the re- the record head is being used as a play head when Correct. you go into sync mode. Right. So that it's act actually what is actually happening is you're listening off the record head rather than listening off the play head, so that you can actually hit the record button. On cue. However, in these early mono days, they didn't have sync heads, <laughs> or they didn't have a sync this is, function. This is so, pre less uh, Paul. It was not possible to do it. Yeah, mm-hmm. this is like this is pre everything. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Re- it's not quite pre Les Paul itself. because uh, Les Paul was in the late fifties, and uh, I started just a little bit after that. So once you'd got to work and lit the fire in the corner to room, warm the room up, <laughs> right. you would fire up your tape machine. Well, Darren, a, fun, a, a funny thing is that uh, the, the studio that I started in, we. We moved uh, uh, less than a year after I started in radio. We moved to a new, brand new building, which is still standing today. But um, the the studio that we had, the um, it, it was wasn't air conditioned. The, the building wasn't air conditioned at all. So we had to leave the the, the window open <coughs> to let some air in. And we had in Rockhampton. Uh, we were quite close to the uh, post office, the big building in town, which chimed every hour. So you, you would hear the chime coming through the window because we, we actually had a, um, a baffle which could be put up to cover the window, but we wouldn't get any air. So no one used it. <laughs> so, so every hour we'd hear the post office clock coming through. I, I have a funny story. I have a funny story about sink heads and play heads and sort of coming out of this era. I had a friend who worked at um, the record plant and uh, some other big studios in New York City. And so right when they had eight tracks and they had 16 tracks, but some of the studios that couldn't afford you know, 16 tracks had a whole lot of eight tracks and they still needed to do these bigger productions. And so what they would do is they would get three of these eight tracks lined up together. The one in the middle would run its tape normally. The one on the far left would have its tape from the supply reel go across all of its heads, skip its 
pitch, pinch roller and capstan and get sandwiched into the pinch roller and capstan of the middle machine. And then feed all the way through to the machine on the right side, which would be the take-up reel. And then you hit record, wow. and now you've wow. got two eight tracks <laughs> running in sync, 16 tracks. Oh, good. Yeah, that. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> well, I don't think they qu- were quite advanced when they recorded Sergeant Pepper's. Um, well, Sergeant Pepper um, was four track. Uh, the system. Yeah. It was, it was, I think it was actually two four tracks. And yes. um, they, they, I, I think they used a one track on each to, um, to provide a sync. Um, uh, Possibly. And yeah. that well, it's a bounce that you really had. Yeah. They were, they were bouncing from one uh, to the yeah, other. I th- yeah. yeah, I think they actually only had, had six tracks, but, but at least it was better than four. Yeah, and that was one-inch four-track. One-inch four-track, yeah. sounds great. Uh, that, would, that would actually sound really good because, yep. um, because the, wi- you know, the wider the, the track you record on, obviously the higher the quality, the lower the noise. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. We're getting kicked off the air. Well, we're getting kicked off. Yeah, I think sorry. everyone needs a snooze now. <laughs> and, uh, well... Some of us already had one. <laughs> Some of us already had one. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to live that down, Snoozy. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's Andrew's I've got a, I've got a, smooth voice that did it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I got a bunch of sound effects. Don't you worry. I'd, you'd probably be safer sending me what's on there. Trust me. Uh, dear. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much. That was awesome. Thanks, Very Phil. Cool. Appreciate you beaming in. It was in. a pleasure. And uh, let's not <laughs> wait another 25 years before we talk. Yeah, absolutely. Come to Sydney, have a beer. <laughs> It was, yeah, it was. I think it was about 26 years, actually, to be quite honest. It was uh, in the 90s. Yep, it certainly was, yeah. Goodbye, goodbye. Wipe the tear, baby, from your eye. Though it's hard to part, I know. I'll be tickled to death to go. Don't cry, don't sigh. There's a silver lining in the sky. Bonsoir, old thing, cheerio, chin, chin, na, hoo, toodaloo, goodbye.